Hi, my name is Linda Mahan O, oh, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. We're coming to you today from backstage at the famous Hill Auditorium with our very special guest, Linda May Han Oh. Hello, Linda. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thank you. It's our pleasure. It's an honor. We've been trying to get you on for a while, but you're just so busy. And here we are just a little bit before the Pat Metheny Show, and I know you've been with Pat for a while. I want to get to that, but I think our audience would be interested in hearing something about your musical upbringing because you have a fascinating background. You're born in Malaysia. Spent? I don't, did you pretty much grow up in Australia, or you spent some time there? And older sisters with the record collection. What I'm getting at is t tell us briefly about your musical upbringing and how you became a bass player. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I was born in Petaling Jaya in Malaysia, and I grew up in Perth, Western Australia, and I played a bit of um, classical piano since I was four years old, and um, I transitioned through to clarinet and bassoon, but um, midway through high school, I started dabbling on electric bass. Um, I had an uncle who gave me an electric bass um, one day, and um, it was the best thing ever that kind of uh, changed a lot of things and I just started working out a lot of bass lines and um, I played in a garage band in high school um, and my older sister had a really really diverse record collection um, she listened to everything from Michelle and Degia Cello to John Zorn to Miles Davis to Weather Report so um, it was that that kind of inspired me um, to kind of get deeper into jazz into improvisation um, and as well as in school, uh, we were playing a bit in the, the school bands, um, the school jazz bands, but uh, there was also a West Australian Youth Jazz Orchestra, which is still around, and I was playing bassoon in the woodwind section, and I would turn around and see a lot of great musicians uh, behind me who were um, improvising and playing um, a lot of really interesting things, um, one of whom is Dane Alderson, who now plays bass in the Yellow Jackets. So um, a lot of really great talent there in Perth, um, a lot of great inspiration. Um, and from there, I transitioned into um, Manhattan School of Music, uh, where I pursued my master's degree and moved to New York City. Yeah. Well, that, that's a long way from Australia. I do want to ask you a question. I know Australia is an awfully big country, but did you ever happen to cross paths with Emma Anzai? from Sick Puppies? Um, no, I know the band Sick Puppies though, but I, d I don't know her personally, no. I think she was, I think she might have been born in Malaysia. I know she spent time in Tokyo, but she grew up in Australia and mm -hmm. y you have some overlap with your backgrounds. Once you discovered your uh, discovered the bass, did you find yourself listening to music differently, picking out different different sound, you know, picking the different bass players? Did you have any musical heroes or bass influences? Yeah, um, definitely when I listened to Night Train, Oscar Peterson's Night Train, and when I heard Ray Brown, that was the kind of turning point that made me really want to take up uh, upright bass um, seriously. You know, um, it just his sound, his presence, his time, his feel, um, what he could do on the instrument, it was just so inspiring, and I knew I wanted to know how to do that, you know. Did, did, how long did you play electric before you picked up the upright? Uh, like a couple of years, two or three years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you've got, uh, I, I almost didn't know where to start with the interview because you've done so much as a, a side person and as a leader, you're a composer. Tell us some, some of the highlights from your career. Let, let's start with your own band. I was privileged to see you at the uh, International Society of Bassists Convention in Colorado. I think that was 2015. Mm -hmm. And I remember the audience talking about you. I remember everybody's reaction to seeing you play. But tell me about Linda Mahan O oh first as a band leader. Mm. Um, yeah, so at that time that was right after my album Sun Pictures and since then I've also released an album called A Walk Against Wind. Um, it's a little different, I play a bit more electric on that album um, and um, I've been doing a lot more writing more than I ever have been. Um, doing a lot more writing that's a bit more bass oriented. Um, a, a lot of the melodies on the last album are kind of doubled or complemented by the bass um, and it kind of takes more of a front seat role in, in some ways. Um, and um, yeah, so, and as a group, it's, it, um, there's a lot of room for, um, to move um, in terms of the improvisational sections, sections 
Um, and um, yeah, so right now I'm doing a lot of writing for, I have an octet, um, which also has um, uh, kind of the, the quartet function of um, sax, uh, piano, bass, drums, but um, also augmented with a string quartet. So that album should be coming out next year. It's called Aventurine. Um, I do have Walk Against the Wind here. Um, it's a slightly different format. Um, it's on a record label called Biophilo Records. And G- give us the title again. Uh, Walk Against Wind. Walk Against Wind. And that, that just came out, right? Um, yeah, it came out uh, in 2017. Okay. Um, the title is from Marcel Masso's routine, Walking right. Against the Wind. And it's kind of just about um, uh, the obstacles that we push through um, for greater re- reward, whatever that might be. T- talk about that for a minute, if you don't mind. I remember reading that about you and about the album and you taking him as some kind of inspiration, but would you mind elaborating for just a moment on that, on Marcel Marceau and how that that morphed into this, this release? Mm. Well, it kind of started um, when I was trying to prepare some clinics and workshops um, geared towards um, kind of more... Um, high school, maybe early college um, students talking about nonverbal communication in music and and um, subtle things that we can do, um, expressive things that can help shape the music without having to speak, having to use words to do that and um, whether that might mean body language or dynamics or something, you know. And um, so I was looking at interpretations of, of music and, and how it can be interpreted um, through movement and Marcel Masso is kind of a master at doing that and he inspired so many people such as Michael Jackson and um, there was a beautiful video that I found of him um, kind of miming along to a trombone solo and an alto solo and it's it's really quite beautiful and um, just that expressive quality was a great thing to show students um, but also um, he was a pretty interesting man he um, was extremely talented as a pantomime, but also um, extremely talented artist. And during the Second World War, he used his talents to help um, young Jewish children um, with his skills with children and pantomime. He um, successfully smuggled some of the children to safety. And with his excellent um, drawing ability, he knew how to um, manufacture different identification cards in order for these kids to be safe so um, just in a bigger picture sense I think it's um, great to talk to students about just bigger picture about um, music and what what you can do with that and and just basically what you can do with your art form that that could be a bigger picture thing you know uh, who would have thought of Marcel Marceau as being the inspiration for a, a musical project mm-hmm. you have some some uh, lyric list vocals on some of the stuff that you've done that I've seen also uh, let's talk about the Pat Metheny gig. Mm. Uh, you've had that now for what, like four years or something like that? Um, since 2016. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. And there was something about you, you met at the Detroit Jazz Festival, you and Pat, and then the, the, and you met him a couple years later, and he said, did you get my email? Said, what, what email? You were trying to reach me? Yeah. Tell us the story about how you got the gig with Pat. Um, yeah, so um, I think the first time we met was at Detroit Jazz Festival in 2013. Um, hands down one of my favorite festivals where everyone can enjoy such incredible music and it's just such a beautiful vibe um and um so i was playing i think at the time with um joe lovano and dave douglas the band called sound prince um which is kind of a a wayne shorter um influenced band um and i didn't hear what influenced band uh, wayne shorter wayne shorter based on that he was there last year actually Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, John Petitucci and Brian Blade. Mm, yeah. So um, we were, I think, sharing the same stage um, as, as I think, Pat's Unity Band. And um, I met him backstage, and, and he was he was very nice. And, um, and then two years later, in 2015, um, I was playing um, on a similar stage. Um, and he was playing with Gary Burton, and we, we spoke, and that's when we exchanged um, info, and we played some duo at his place. And then, next thing you know, um, I'm extremely lucky and privileged to be able to play his music and play with him and play in this wonderful band with Antonio Sanchez and Guillaume Simcock. Well, Pat's got a pretty big catalog, and his music goes back, you know, I don't know, 30, probably close to 40 years. 
are you ever in a position where he would say to you, uh, p play that like like Mark Egan, or play that like Steve Rodby, or play play that like like Jocko, or or you know, are you free to to give it what you think it needs while giving honor to the original? I mean, how do you how do you find that balance? Um, you know, yeah, he's he's never once um, said that I should sound like like someone else, and and there's always that feeling of of. Um, you know what came before and and trying to live up to a certain standard for sure um i feel like it's more about honoring the composition and and the the setting um whilst also having that freedom to to um have my own thing you know so it's it's a balance and um yeah yeah mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your technique you play upright you play electric do, do you play much fretless electric bass uh no no i don't okay <laughs> But by the way, your intonation on the upright is exquisite. I just love listening to you. But uh, you, I, I've got a couple of buddies, Steve Bailey and Brian Bromberg, who are great electric players. And, and the reason I mention those two is because when they get up into the thumb position on the electric bass, they do that literally with their thumb. Did, did, did I read that you borrowed some of that technique? Do you implement that on the electric bass as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't aware that they do that, but yeah, that's definitely something that I do just, um, there's some chordal stuff that I've written that um, the only way, my hands aren't that big, and, and the only way for me to reach those um, those notes and those chords uh, is to use thumb position on, on electric bass, and I do find it quite handy uh, for certain things, yeah. I don't know. I've fooled around with it. It just doesn't come natural. I remember Brian telling me one time, he says, I, I played electric, and now he's trying to learn the upright. He says, I don't have time to learn a different technique. This mm -hmm. a technique, this is the way I learned it. This is the way I do it. Uh, do, do you play with Pat more upright or more electric? Um, for the most part, upright, um, yeah. Um, there were a couple of songs that I would play uh, electric on, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but none of the the fretless stuff from the from the early days and mm, no no <laughs> okay well hey it's a new generation and it's always great to hear new interpretations with with new talent. What about the future? What else would you like to do that you haven't already accomplished? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm doing a lot more writing. Um, I have this album coming out next year, Aventurine, um, with string quartet. Uh, I also have a trumpet tree album that should be out with Amber Zakin Missouri and Taishon Sori. Um, so a lot more writing. Um, uh, we have recorded an album with this band, um, with Pat and Antonio and Gwilym, and so that should be out sometime in the future. Do you know the name of that record yet? No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's that, and um, yeah, re really trying to write more um, and uh, write for lighter ensembles. Um, I just got a Chamber Music America grant, so I'll be working on that this year and next year and um, see what I can come up with, yeah. Well, we all look forward to, to seeing and hearing lots more from you. I do want to ask you briefly about your gear. Mm. And uh, you, you uh, it seems to be da David Gage and the, uh, the, the Realist pickup, you use that, and the Dario Strings, I think, mm. Federa. Why don't you tell me, instead of me telling you, tell me, uh, I, uh, folks always want to hear about what gear our uh, interviewees are using. Mm. Sure. Um, so at the moment I have a, a Fretchner um, upright bass um, and it's um, been converted to have the neck off, removable neck by David Gage. Um, and um, at the moment it's kind of a mixture of different strings, but yes, Daddario strings um, as well as an olive um, on the G string. Um, I use sometimes a DPA microphone. Um, at the moment um, this uh, our sound um, front of house sound guy Austin Stillwell, he's using an, um, I believe it's an Earthworks, uh, I'm not sure the model number, but um, he, he likes it because it's quite balanced, um, and um, and I think more directional as well, so um, less spill from the drums. Um, I run, at the moment, my upright, and at the moment I'm playing a Moulin P bass, um, and I run both of them through a Grace Felix, um, um, I've used the Grace Felix preamp as um, uh, a way to mic blend the mic and the pickup of the upright, but at the moment in this setting, it's it's a very nice AB box um, for the electric and the upright. And um, at the, this is the first tour where I'm trying some new gear, the Moulin P bass and um, the Aguilar setup. Um, I've, I've forgotten the exact model numbers, but um, uh, SR 700 or something, yeah. I 
I always blank on those things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So. And Federa, did I get that right? Are you still playing Federa? Yeah, I'm still playing the Federa five string um, NYC bass. Yeah. So. Mm. All right. Well, I know you have to get going. Sound check and showtime and all that. I do have one last question for you. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? And it's got to be something outside of music. You can't say a composer, producer, arranger, band leader. Mm. Um, I <laughs> I often joke um, some sort of like law, some sort of like environmental law or something. Um, you know, I that was the path at one point I was thinking of doing law and music. And um, my husband, um, Fabian Almazan, who's a pianist, and um, we've been getting into, well, he started a, a a record label called Biophilia, which um, I- which is what my latest album is on, and we try and do some volunteer work um, in terms of cleanups around New York City, and try and organise um, events like that, and liaise with um, organisations to kind of um, just just do something positive, you know, especially in this climate of of um, denial of of things that are going on in the environmental um scope of things and we do have a packaging that's um fsc certified paper with vegetable based inks and it's um it's origami there's no plastic so there is can i eat it you cannot eat it (laughs) well actually no you probably could (laughs) and you'd be okay um i was just curious i wasn't gonna (laughs) try it um and you know it's just an alternative um to just like a jewel case cd or a digipack cd um i mean obviously um, you know, it's still paper and it's still being manufactured. But, you know, people often talk about having something tangible um, to have the liner notes and this way you get a bunch of liner notes. You can still download great um, quality wave files or FLAC files. Um, you don't have to get just MP3s and it's all from Bandcamp as well. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we try and do a little bit of that and, yeah. Well, good for you. May you be an inspiration to us all because uh, we, are, we all need that kind of thinking. So thank you on behalf of all of us. Backstage at Ann Arbor's famous Hill Auditorium with our very, very special guest today, Linda Mahon-O. Oh. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Mm-hmm.